welcome again, everybody. I'm Christy Sullivan. I'm the secretary of the American Society for Cellular and Computational Toxicology. Today's webinar is presented by AICCT and also the European Society for Toxicology in vitro. I would encourage you to visit our website if you want to learn more about our organizations and get uh, join our email lists or join our societies to, to keep up to date with our activities and support programs like this webinar program. Um, if you're familiar with our organizations, you know that we host regular meetings and pursue other activities to uh, promote in vitro and computational toxicology. We offer education and training and try to support early career scientists in their endeavors. And as you might know, the ASCCT annual meeting is held in October of every year. If you participated in that, thank you very much. You can read more about the meeting on the ASCCT website. And please do get in touch. We're about to start planning the next one for 2022. If you want to help uh, be on the planning committee or provide some input into what the meeting should be like, uh, please feel free to get in touch. Um, also, ESTIV is gonna be holding its next meeting in Barcelona in November of next year, 2022. And it looks like abstract submission is gonna be opening up in December. So the webinar is recorded and the recording will be posted on the ASCCT website a few days from now. And um, you probably are, this Zoom webinar is probably old hat for you by now, but just in case you can put questions for the presenter into the Q&A toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Please put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat, okay? If you do need to reach us for some technical reason, um, please, you can use the chat for that. Be great. Okay. So I just wanted to mention that um, we have some upcoming webinars. They haven't been scheduled yet, so you can't register for them yet, but we are putting them on the schedule and we'll let you know when they are available. So uh, a program related to next gen risk assessment we're envisioning, and also uh, a webinar on three dimensional gene, gene tox assays. And in December and in February, it looks like, we will offer uh, a couple of webinars showcasing the work of our ESTIV and ASCCT 2021 award winners. Each of our organizations gives out awards at various conferences for best presentations, best posters, and then we invite the winners to, to, to share their work in a short uh, webinar featuring a number of, of these uh, up and coming scientists. So. Hope you will join us for those. And then without uh, further ado, I'll introduce our speaker for today. Oliver Weimer did his PhD in cancer research at the Leibniz Institute for Experimental Virology in 2000 and founded his first company that same year. CCS Cell Culture Service offered cell line generation and cell banking for pharma drug discovery and was the first supplier of custom assay ready cell banks in Europe, initially used in high throughput screening campaigns. In 2012, CCS was sold to a major CRO and Oliver was engaged in business development at different companies for a couple of years. And then he started uh, this uh, new venture Accelerate in 2014. At Accelerate, now the cumulative expertise in assay ready cells is, is transferred to applications in toxicology and GMP bioassays. And Oliver is also founder and manager of a number of life science companies in the Europe, in the US and Europe. So he's gonna be talking to us today about how to control and maintain the quality of cell cultures. And Oliver, feel free to share your screen. I'll take over now. Okay. So thank you, Christy, for this kind introduction. And thank you, Estes and ASCCT for, the, for giving me the opportunity to talk here about this very important topic of quality in cell culture. So if you develop a cell-based assay, you probably have to balance uh, multiple requirements. You might think about the good availability of cell lines and the reproducibility of monolayer mono cells. But your assay might demand a higher productivity of primary cells and tissues, or you might also need the 
high complexity of an organ on a ship um, or anything kind of in between. What all these assays have in common, they all include viable living cells and cells undergo changes and cells can be quite cranky. So what you need to find ways for a better standardization of cell-based assays. And actually, almost 20 years ago, or even more 20 years ago, Thomas Harton uh, got this initial ideas of having a good cell culture practice. And these ideas have been cast in the guidelines three years later. And over the recent years, more specific publications came out on stem cells or on organized models. And we're now actually looking forward to a version two of the GCCP guidelines, which are currently are under discussion. But what actually determines the quality of a cell culture or cell-based assays? First of all, all, there is of course the cultivation and the handling of the cells, the different lab personnel, the operators, the scientists, how they, how they manipulate the cell line. Second, all the kind of consumables, medium and supplements, the culture vessels you're using, but also the equipment determines the quality of your cell culture. More on the cellular end, you should think about the stability of your cultures, and of course, should be courses about contamination, so sterility is an important topic, and also the identity of your cell cultures. And finally, last not but, last but not least, the storage of your cell, line, cell lines, how to of your cells to maintain the quality of your cultures. So if you think about cultivation, all comes down to the operators. You probably have a lot of experts in your cell culture lab and they, they all are right. They, but the problem is they, they all handle cells probably a little different and you will very often hear, uh, I've always done it that way, I won't change the process. That's good for the cell, not so good for the cell because if there is one thing which self does not like, do not like is inconsistency. Although if all these experts might be right, they handle self different. So it is really important that you design very specific operating procedures for your individual cell lines and train your operators to stick to this uh, protocol and not do any change. And even minor changes uh, might have an impact on the quality of your cell culture. Finally, you should, also, of course, frequently and regularly monitor the quality of your cultures and document all the processes of your, of your, of your handling of the manipulation of the cell. I would really recommend to count the cells at each passage of your, of your cultures. You could apply manual counting and also assess the viability by this, by, for example, by tripon blue staining. But you, of course, could also apply an automated cell count to do that. You see here on this uh, uh, histogram, this is from a um, particle counter, which basically differentiates the dead cells from the viable cells by, uh, by the impedance of different impedance of the membranes and measuring the diameter of the particle. So you have in this histogram here, the viable cells, which give this broader peak of a, of a larger diameter. And by purpose, I picked a, a not so viable uh, sample here between these two borders. You have your dead cells, which come up with the lower diameter because it only measures the nucleus. The good thing of using these particle counters for cell counting and viability measurement is that it also gives you numbers about the amount of debris, which comes down here at the lower part, at the, at the low, very low diameter. And debris, smaller particles, are a very good indicator on the quality of your cell culture because if your cells don't do well, that cells disintegrate and you will see a high increase in debris. And it also gives you, which is important for suspension cells in particular, it also gives you an idea about the aggregation, the so duplicates or, or multiple uh, cells in an aggregate, which come here as a, as a higher diameter. So you get an idea about the aggregation of your cell culture. The second important measure you should have is of course the, the control is the density of your cell culture. This is easy for suspension cells. You simply count the cells per volume, 
for the adherence so usually the confluence is used but this is uh, difficult to, to measure you could apply kind of image uh, computer aided imaging but to do this by an I estimate it, it's really subjective and, and difficult. So I would recommend to apply here a cell density as well in terms of cells per square meter at each passage when you have detached adherent cells from the surface, measure the cell quantity, so, uh, so count the cells and then calculate the, the harvest density, so the density of the cells on your plate and define a maximum harvest density so that you can be sure that you never overgrow your culture so that they don't come too confident. And by having the seeding density of your cells and the harvest density of your cells, you can easily calculate the growth rate. And the growth rate is definitely another very important measure of, for the quality of your cell culture. If you see significant drops in your growth rate, then you know that something goes wrong and you can quantify that by this. The good thing is you can compare your, your current culture with previous cultures uh, if, you, if, the, if the, the decrease in, in the growth rate and something might get, get wrong. Finally, you should always check the morphology of yourself during cultivation. In the next slides, I will give you some examples how the cultivation, the culture conditions have an impact on the quality of your cells and the outcome of your assay. This is a uh, reported gene um, cell line, and we have three different cultures here. So the red curve is from a subconfluent culture, and it gives, provides a very good signal, a very good response to the, um, to the hormone, to the agonist. Uh, if we grow the cells, if the cells have been grown to confluence before use, which is the green curve, uh, they do not respond very well. This is not so much surprising because confluent grown cells usually don't work as good anymore. What is remarkable here is that if you look at the, at the blue curve, the blue culture, this has been cells which had been grown to confluent actually three passages before they had been used for the assay. And after that, we, they had been grown within the specifications, but actually the cells did not recover and give not a significant better result response um, as the cells which have been grown to confluence directly before use. So these cells cannot really be used whenever they have been grown, overgrown, and grown to confluence. So really be careful with that. This is another example, another recombinant cell line expressing uh, GPCR hormone receptor, and we measured the second messenger uh, in this cell. We have two cultures here, the blue and the green one, which gave a very good signal, but the red one, the red curve, you see that the signal to signal ratio is very much decreased. And we actually first didn't know what happened here because the viability of this field cell has never been grown to confluence. But if we look at the uh, cultivation protocol of these cells, we realized that a passage for the aggregation of the cells uh, had been increased, probably due to not optimal handling during detachment. So the cells aggregated, and this was followed by a lower viability at P5. After that, the cells recovered fine. The viability was great, the aggregation was going down again, and the day of, of the assays, the perfect the cells looked just perfect. But if you look back, very most likely the mishandling of the cells at P4 uh, was the reason for the lower response of the cells in the assay. So this was about cultivation and cell handling. Another important part of cell quality is of course the material you are using. I would not spend too much time on culture vessels and media. Of course, they, they should fit for purpose. You should use suspension flask for your suspension culture and tissue culture treated flask for your adherent cultures. You should always be aware of supplier differences and qualify your materials for your particular use. Um, I will pay a little bit more attention on serum. Serum is as a supplement to your medium, very still very frequently used in, in cell culture laboratories. 
serum stimulates the cell proliferation and enhances the cell attachment and also buffers toxic substances. But of course, there are two major reasons why you should probably not use serum in your cell culture. First, um, as long as you use fetal bovine serum as a supplement for your uh, medium, your in vitro assay would not really be animal free. This is an important part. And second, um, the quality of serum very much differs from lot to lot. So if you use serum in your culture, you have to qualify individual lots if they support yourself and your particular assay. You should have a look at the origin of the serum and the level of qualification from the supplier, but then do specific testing on various serum lots. And you can see an example down here. So we usually have a look at the endotoxin level and we test the serum for different assays. We use the tear assay for CACO2 cells and the macrophage activation assay with THP1 cells. And we also, of course, check viability and the, how the serum supports the growth of different cell lines to finally choose usually two different lots um, where we purchase or reserve a larger, a larger quantity of bottles to support uh, our cell cultures on a longer term. But again, whenever possible, you should try to replace the serum from your cultures. There are good serum free alternatives uh, and a lot of cell lines can be, um, can be trained to grow in serum free media. And if you cannot replace it, you should at least try to reduce the serum level. I would not, not talk a little bit on a, another very common misunderstanding in cell culture, which has a high impact on the quality of your, of your cultures. And this is the level of carbon dioxide in your incubators. Uh, most people think that this is a kind of a standard that says that you always have to use 5% CO2 in a incubator. You read this everywhere. But actually this concentration of CO2 is just part of the buffering system which regulates the pH of your medium. And the second part of this buffering system is the sodium bicarbonate in your medium. And the concentration of this can vary very much between the different medium. So the standard and optimal pH for cell cultures would be in the range of 7.2 to 7.3. But if you look at DMEM, which has a high concentration of sodium bicarbonate, this would, at a CO2 concentration of 5%, um, end up with a, at a pH of 7.7. .7. This is almost uh, close to a basic um, um, pH. For cell lines which grow quickly and have a high metabolism, those cells will probably acidify their, their medium very quickly. So they can deal with that. And this is probably the reason why 5% CO2 became kind of a standard in, in most cell culture labs. But if you have a cell line which isn't growing that quickly and have a lower metabolism and you struggle to cultivate those cells in DMEM, you should consider to increase the CO2 concentration in your incubator, uh, almost double it to optimize the pH for, for this slower growing cell line. So this was all about these more external factors. So let's talk about what's going on with the cells themselves. Uh, first of all, we should talk about stability. Um, primary cells, at least some primary cells, can be passaged for a couple of, so can be kept in culture for a couple of population doublings until they undergo senescence. So those cells have a limited lifespan and you have kind of a defined end, you can of 50 passage doublings, and then you should not use the cells anymore. However, also immortal, infinite, immortalized cell lines um, undergo aging. So the, with the population doublings, they accumulate genetic or epigenetic generation uh, alterations, and they might change their properties. So you should always keep an eye on this aging as well. And for most of the cell lines in the SOP, there is a certain passage number limit um, indicated. That's 
it's fine to, to have this as a, as a kind of thumb rule, but you should be aware that the passage number does not necessarily correlate with the cell age because the passage number very much depends on how frequently split the cells at what ratio. The more accurate measure for the cell age would actually be the number of cell doublings or population doublings. To encounter aging of cells, the best way is to establish a good cell banking system so that you have a continuous and safe supply of your cells at a defined uh, cell passage or population doubling. So you will probably start with a small token stock <coughs> of just a few bars, which will be the reference for all derivatives and, and siblings of, of, of your cells. And then you use one of these bars to expand this to a master cell bank of a hundred or fifty valves, and then take in one while of this master cell bank to further expand this for, in my calculation here, up to passage doubling forty-two, have a thousand valves of a working cell bank. And if you use this system at the end, you could come up to a maximum of half a million vials of working cell bank vials, which each of one could start one of a, a new culture for, for your, or from your cell line to support your assays. And with this system, you can always be sure that, we, that you will not lose the cells because you can always go back to a new master vial or even a token vial. Stability does not only depend on the age of the cells. It also depends on cell handling and culture conditions. You should also have an eye on, on the expression of certain markers which are necessary to support your different assays. And I have an example here from a recombinant cell line which expresses a surface marker, which of course is of the essence for the assay. And we detect this marker by flow cytometry. And you can see here that at the, uh, at, at the passage three, at the passage three, Oh, sorry, at passage eight, you have a very good expression of this surface marker. And if you further cultivate the cells up to passage 21, you see that another peak of cells coming up here, which is not expressing the marker at, at this very well level anymore. And so the cells lose the expression of this recombinant marker over time. So just to demonstrate how important it could be to, to control the expression of either endogenous or recombinant uh, markers expressed in your cells. As a final example, I would um, talk about uh, the pluripotency of stem cells. We have uh, IPS colonies here, and if you expand the IPS colonies, you want to make sure that you maintain the pluripotency of the, of the culture and avoid the accumulation of spontaneously differentiated cells. If you look at these pictures here, which I've borrowed from the European Bank of Induced Pluripotency Protein Stem Cells, you see at the left image, this is a really nice um, IPS quality, uh, colony with sharp edges. And on the image on your right, you see that from the edges that have been differentiated cells were outgrown from the colony. And this is what you don't one. So you should have analyzed those cultures microscopically and try to remove or at least avoid um, the differentiation, spontaneous differentiation of these kinds of cells. Coming now to another very important topic uh, which uh, determines the quality of your cells. And this is, of course, the sterility and the absence of contamination. The most prominent one and very obvious is, of course, the contamination with bacteria, fungi, and yeast. This is what you can see easily already, at least under the microscope, you can see that, that your cultures have been contaminated with bacteria. But if you think about um, slow-growing bacteria, or if you have any kind of um, antibiotic in your culture medium, you will probably not see this. And this is why we definitely recommend that you use specific process which support um, the growth of different types of bacteria, yeast, and fungi. 
So you can inoculate those processed with samples from your, from your cell cultures and cultivate those for a couple of days. And if you have a contamination in your culture, a cloudiness will occur in this, this samples, which you can easily see. And even if your cell culture medium still looks good, you, you can, can be sure that you have a contamination in your culture and you should discard the cell. The more beastly box actually are mycoplasma. So they persist in your culture and they can easily spread throughout, the, throughout your lab. They are basically sitting on each of you and can easily contaminate your culture without seeing that because they are so small, you can't see them under the microscope. Luckily, there are different types of very sensitive assay kits available to detect mycoplasma contamination in cell culture and thematic assays, but also PCR assays. And this example here is a PCR assay for 16S our RNA from a coding region of the mycoplasmas have been amplified. This is a very sensitive assay which detects a lot of different mycoplasma species. And if you look at the PCR results here, a contaminated culture would be easily visible by a band um, above the control band here. And those cultures, cultures should be discarded immediately. This, as easy as these kits are, uh, regular mycoplasma testing should be established in each cell culture lab to, to avoid the, the spread, spreading and distribution of mycoplasma. To make the story complete, also viral contamination could be a, a, very, a threat for your cell cultures. Um, in particular, if you're working a lot with primary cells from primary samples. The highest concern, of course, is if you work with human cells from human samples, then this is a real safety concern. You want to be sure that uh, the, the cells, uh, the primary cells are free of human pathogenic viruses. But also uh, from, from animal samples, there can be adventitious viruses from bovine, porcine, or other species in your cultures, which you do not want to have. Finally, you should also have an uh, if you work with, with recombinant viruses from your molecular toolbox, you should have an eye on that and handle those with care to um, avoid any kind of cross-contamination of cultures you don't want to have. So, but how to maintain sterility? So the best way to fight a contamination is still just don't let it happen. So wear lab coats and gloves and clean shoes whenever possible and always disinfect your hands, so also with, uh, disinfect your gloves and instruments, and don't touch your face. A lot of people do this unconsciously um, and really try to train not to touch your face because this is where the mycoplasma are sitting, and this is the most common way how, how you introduce mycoplasma into your culture. A very honest recommendation, do not use any kind of prophylactic antibiotics because those will only mask a contamination and they will promote resistance, coming up with a much more severe problem than you already have. So don't use, the, get away from prophylactic antibiotics. If there is a contamination, just throw away the cell. If you have a suspicious culture or a new culture from, from a different lab, send those into a quarantine laboratory. So just to reduce the risk that those cultures can contaminate your healthy ones. And again, I've said this a couple of times, discard contaminated cultures immediately. There's no, it's, it's no really reasonably to, to try to cure those. And finally, apply a regular hygiene monitoring. So you get an idea on the germ burden in, in, your, in your cell culture lab, on the surfaces and also on the, in the air. There is one more contaminant, uh, which is even more dangerous than, than all the other. And this is the cross contamination between cell lines. So the international uh, cell line often committee registered 531 misidentified cell lines where no authentic stock is known. Some of them are cross-contaminated with other species. For some of them, not even the contaminant is known. The most 
prominent contaminant is still the HeLa cells. The problem of misidentified cell lines, it, it's becoming more prominent in the cell culture community. So it, it's not so, so severe anymore. Uh, also because there are good ways available to confirm the identity of the cell line. So first, of course, there is STR analysis to um, kind of identify human cell lines. This is basically the same as a paternity test. You amplify very variable short tandem repeats in, in your cells, and this results in a very specific banding pattern, which is unique to this particular cell line. And there are STR profiles for most of the human cell lines available in databases as a reference um, for your sample. The good is there are a lot of testing laboratories available <clears throat> which offers this analysis for a reasonable price. So if you work with human cell lines and particularly with different human cell lines in parallel, you should really consider to perform this STR analysis on a frequent basis to really exclude any kind of cross-contamination between your cell lines. The interspecies cross-contamination cannot be excluded by STR analysis because the primates are different. So what there are other methods available, what we do in our laboratory, we have established a multiplex PCR where primers have been designed to amplify mitochondrial DNA, and the primers are designed in a way that they amplify a defined fragment size specific to a particular species. So if you run this multiplex um, PCR, and we see this here in the positive control, we have these different bands for each species, and then we have samples from different cell lines here, and each cell line come up with a distinct band for this particular species. And if you have a cross-contamination by, by a different species, um, then you would see a, a double band in this, this sample. And this is a easy to perform assay. Um, it's very sensitive and it gives you quite good reliability that you do not have a cross-contamination with other species in your, in your human cell lines. So how to avoid cross-contamination, of course, you should apply all the hygiene measures, which I already talked about when we, when we spoke about sterility. And in addition to that, you should not handle multiple cell lines at the same time. Really try to, to separate your workflow in a way that, that you only use one cell line after the other and clean your bench in between. Separate cell lines in the incubator from each other. And if you do not have so many incubators, you should at least use tissue culture flask with filter caps. Don't try to avoid open systems like plates or uh, where, where, where the where cross contamination could happen much more easily. Know where your cells are coming from. If you have a new cell line in your lab and you purchase it from a cell depository, you can be probably quite safe. But if you got the cells from a befriended lab, be cautious and do some anal analysis on the cells before you use them to be sure that they are really clean and not contaminated with, with any other cell line. If you generate cell lines in your own lab, um, try to establish an STR profile for the sale for the cells at the earliest time point for your token stock so that you really have a reference uh, for all cell lines which derive from that. Finally, I will talk about my favorite topic, actually, the cryopreservation of, of cells, which of course can have a very uh, significant impact to maintain the, the quality of your cultures. So cryopreservation actually means that you freeze the cells on a very slow cooling rate in the presence of a cryoprotectant, for example, DMSO, and this prevents the formation of ice crystals. So the water becomes kind of an amorphous, non-crystalline state of glass. And this is actually the hallmark for cryopreservation to maintain the viability of the cell. If you use these kind of freezing aids like a uh, isopropanol filled container or styrofoam uh, built uh, things, 
they support this slow cooling and you can use those to, to prepare cryopreserved stocks of your cells. However, what happens during the freezing, freezing process, and if you look at this temperature trace it's down here, um, you see that the samples are undercooled. And at this certain point where the aggregate of the, of the solution changes to a solid state, latent heat is released from the sample until the temperature is further decreased. And this increase in, in temperature and release of latent heat actually can damage your cells. Uh, this is why we really recommend to use a control grade freezer for cryopreservation, because what a control grade freezer actually does, and this is here on the, on the lower image, what a control grade freezer does is that it blows liquid nitrogen into the chamber at this very point of uh, solidification of the sample and then compensates the release of latent heat. So it, it, it overcomes this, this negative effect and usually results in uh, a much better functional frozen cells. Because I would consider cryopreservation should be more than just freezing for later recovery. It should preserve the full functionality of cells. And this is something which definitely can be achieved. If you optimize your freezing media and improve the cryopreservation protocol for in, in, the, in the controlled rate freezer, you can uh, prepare cryopreserved samples, which can be used in a cell-based assay in an assay-ready format. That means you use the cells directly from the frozen stock without taking them back in culture. This is an approach which has been first published in 2004 from a drug discovery high throughput screening campaign, where they supported the entire screen, screen just from this frozen sample. They used the cells like a reagent and haven't cultivated the cells. And uh, this, of course, changed a lot for the, for the drug discovery. Uh, and, and this is an approach which is now used in, for different applications as well. I have one example here for you, which demonstrates how this optimization of the freezing process can really change the quality of cells. You're probably all familiar with THP1 cells. This is a human monocytic cell line which grows in suspension fairly well. Uh, on the left, you see a propidium iodide staining of the cells. And the first column, these are cells from a continuously passaged culture of the THP1 cells, and you hardly have any PI positive cells in here. If you recover THP1 cells from a regular stock, the cells look quite well directly after thawing, which is the, is, is the upper row here. But 24 hours or 48 hours later, um, PI positive, so damaged cells occur. And THP1 cells, those of you who work with the cells already will confirm that. THP1 cells need about a week up to 10 days until they fully recover from a cryopassage. You would usually see this as a lag phase and then the, the, the cells overgrow the culture and then they're fine again. But when these first two days, you see they, the cells go through a crisis and a lot of cells die. Well, we have optimized the freezing protocol. We have an optimized freezing medium and the freezing protocol for the, for the controlled rate freezer. And with that, we were able to overcome um, that the cells go through this kind of a crisis. And even 24 hours and 48 hours after thawing, we do not see a significant increase of PI positive cells. There are a few, but not that many as one from the regular frozen sample. And if we use these cells in a proliferation assay, you see it here on the right, there is the green curve. This is, these are the cells from a continuous culture, the passage cells. And if we use a frozen sample directly, a standard frozen, frozen stock, and use it in the assay directly, you see that the assay window is very much reduced because a lot of cells are already dying directly um, after thawing. When we apply the acid-ready frozen cells, they respond almost as good as the continuously passaged cells because we were able to overcome this, this crisis after cryopreservation and recovery. 
So you can really change this by, by using assay rad itself, to use them as a reagent. And this has changed a lot for, for many cell-based assay. If we think about this classical way of cell supply where we, where we grow the cells in, in your tissue culture flask, in the continuous maintenance culture, and then the day before the assay, feed the cells into your plate. All these variabilities and differences in culture conditions, which I've just been talking about, have an impact on your cell-based assays. The passage of the cells changes with, over the, the cultivation, and you all, always have a risk of uh, contamination as well. So if you switch to the, to the assay-ready approach, which I like to call it the smart way of cell supply. The idea is that you prepare yourself in the large homogeneous batch, for example, in these cell stacks, and then harvest the cells all at the same time and cryopreserve them according to this improved protocol to have highly functional cryopreserved cells in your stocks, which you then can pre-qualify for your assay. And you know they are working and you can define the specification. And at the day of your assay, you take a single aliquot of these assay-ready cells, dispense them into your plates, and then you're ready to go. And this changes, of course, a lot. Those cells are ready to use like a reagent. You do not have to cultivate them. This, of course, harmonizes a lot of these factors, determinants of cell quality in terms of cultivation, media, and cell age as well. You have a homogeneous pre-qualified batch of cells, which very much increases the precision of your cell-based assays. The cells are instantly available. You just take them out of the freezer, use them at any time you want. And they're also much more convenient to use also from unexperienced operators. You do not have to train your personal on cultivating the cells. You only have to train them on how to use this assay ready article. Finally, I would uh, have some, some words on, on the storage of cells. Um, I already mentioned this kind of glass-like uh, stages. The cells are in, in this amorphous non-crystalline state. And actually this state is maintained at the so-called glass transition point of approximately minus 137 degrees. That's the point where this kind of optimal status is conserved. So you can keep cells at minus 80 for a certain time, but definitely not for longer than just for a few days. Um, if you keep them at minus 80 for longer, uh, slowly crystallization become more prominent and will damage your cells. An alternative is to keep them in a minus 150 ultra low freezer. Um, it's a good option, but you have to be aware of power failure. Um, so a liquid nitrogen backup is definitely recommended for this kind of devices. The optimum is still a liquid nitrogen tank. So store the cells in the vapor phase of liquid nitrogen. This is definitely the, the, the must for a long-term storage. Again, you should avoid also when you store them in liquid nitrogen, you should avoid fluctuations of the temperature. If you take out the rack of cells with the boxes and keep them out of the tank for, for a longer time, the temperature will easily increase above this transition point of 137 degrees. And if this happens too often, then again, the, the formation of ice crystals will be promoted. If you have yourself in, in storage, you should also um, maintain documentation on that. And I know that a lot of cells are still using kind of Excel tables, which might be quite faulty and difficult to manage. So I really recommend to use the software, which is dedicated to, to manage your, your cell samples. And uh, Cell Seeker Inventory is uh, one of those I could recommend because it's, it's a web-based cloud application and it is free to use. You can organize your cells and your stocks with all the characteristics and quality controls and can in, organize your inventory from this virtual stock and check in and check out vibes from that. As a conclusion of my, my talk, I would like to establish the rule of 5D. So D 
develop the acceptance criteria for your cell cages. Know, know what the cell cages are and what is so critical and define the limits for this acceptance criteria. Now, when you culture the cells, detect all changes by close observation and document all cell parameters during the cell cultivation. And finally, discard cells that miss the exact acceptance criteria. Try to cure that in particular if cells are contaminated, discard them. Okay, thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. You're still on mute, Christy. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> Thanks, sorry, I lost my window. Uh, well, thank you so much, Oliver. That was an incredible presentation. So much useful information there for people on how to make sure their, um, their cell cultures maintain uh, quality. We have a few questions in the Q&A so far. Everyone, please enter your questions. Um, if you like, and we'll, we'll pose them to Oliver. So the first question is, what are the different types of cell lines used for neurocytotoxicity testing? Yes, I'm, 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 I'm not really an expert in neurocytotoxicity testing, to okay. be honest. I know there are some immortal cell lines which can be differentiated into, um, neurotype cell lines, uh, but most things, most assays, I guess, are done with IPS-derived um, neural cell lines. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Um, there's a question about the preservation of surface markers. Is there any additional cell culture procedure to improve their detection? Of surface markers, despite then, despite flow cytometry, that that's what we use for for detection usually. So, fluorescence-based flow cytometry is certainly the most easiest way to to do that. Or uh, fluorescence microscopy, of course. Uh, next question is: Do you have any recommendations on strategies to use? to help trace the cells through all the testing, culturing and preservation steps. Um, and maybe further uh, clarification, what documentation should be produced for each vial of cells prior to use for testing? Well, that's a, it's a long, you know, it's not easy to answer this question. <laughs> Probably we should discuss that. Um, off topic. So basically, yeah, you should you should document, of course, all this this kind of, of testing. Um, you should apply different levels for your working for your master cell banks, your working cell banks, and your continuous culture performing the regular tests for for the cell banks. You should definitely do all this sterility testing and identity testing um, so that you're sure that your stocks are okay. Uh, but you should also do this during the continuous culture. I hope this briefly answers the question. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Um, another question is, are there any special recommendations for RPSC derived cell types? To be honest, I'm not an expert in RPSCs. <laughs> that's, not, that's not where I'm very familiar with, so I can't, I can't recall, give any further recommendations here. I think there is a paper um, on specifically on IPSC put out by some folks after a cat workshop, actually. I can't remember the mm -hmm. name of the paper, but I think if you look into the literature, uh, you might find that. Um, let's see. Oh, here's a good question. DMSO is known to affect the epigenetics <laughs> and functionality of cells. Are there any other options? They are, but not, not as better. So that's, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the point. So this is really a, an interesting question because a lot of people, including us, are working on alternatives for DMSO. Um, there are some. Uh, you could try to work with higher molecular sugars. You could try to use antifreeze proteins is, is a common approach. Uh, poly, polymers is a common approach. 
and all kind of combinations by that. You, you can definitely reduce the amount of DMSO. Commonly, a lot of people still use 10% DMSO, which is way too much in our hands. We have reduced this to 5% in general. Nobody is freezing salt with 10% DMSO anymore. But you can go further down if you add some, some higher molecular sugars. But there is no better alternative than DMSO to completely replace it, I would say. Um, there's a question about whether there's any documentation to read, so I think guidance materials regarding best practices for cell culture, but in the context of GLP. Mm, well, GLP is, of course, um, a guidance which, which you should follow, and there are some, some topics about cell culture in there, of course, as well. I would definitely recommend the OECD guideline on good in vitro. Give them is the, the acronym for it. Good in vitro um, method practice. Yeah. Um, that's good. And of course, the, the, the guidance on the good cell culture practice are a good guideline in combination with the GOP, although they are not official guidelines in that context. Okay. Um, it's sort of a Similar question, you mentioned a software to document the cell culture um, processes, I guess. Is it freely downloadable? Is it's that a, software it's a I guess it's a web-based web application. It's, web -based. it's cloud based. You, you, I guess you can sign up and have, an, you have your account and then uh, manage your cell banks there. And could you remind people of the name of the software? Uh, that was, it's Cell Seeker. Can I type it somewhere in here? Yeah, we can put it in the chat. If you open the chat and say to everyone. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, have you, this is an interesting question, have you ever experienced a different outcome in a downstream application after changing something in the cell culture? So for example, if you change the cell culture medium or maybe the serum. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, definitely. So if you change your medium composition, so the question was specifically on IPS cells, but that's where I'm not the expert, but if you, in, in general, if you change your medium composition even slightly, if you change um, supplements, even the source of the supplements, you should be really careful that the properties of your cells do not change with that. So you really have to qualify um, all materials. So just some uh, comment from Aaron Hill about GCCP um, does include iPS cells mm -hmm. in the next, oh, sorry, in the next paper, the next version of that publication. And then um, she agrees with you that uh, uh, GiveUp uh, kind of has GLPs in mind. Um, okay, so <clears throat> a couple of questions about serum. Uh, wondering, is it always recommended to use inactivated FBS in cell cultures no. or? No. So you usually use heat inactivated serum if you use the cells for immunological assays because you inactivate uh, uh, complement factors in, in the serum. So it, there is no recommendation to use heat inactivated FBS in general. In contrast, I would say don't, don't use it if you don't need it because there are a lot of other proteins which are inactivated by the heat which are actually promoting the growth and are mm. useful. Uh, so maybe then follow on question to that is um, transitioning to animal free chemically defined conditions is challenging. Can you give some advice on what to look for? Mm. Animal free and chemical defined are two, two parts of it. So animal free does not necessarily mean that it is chemical defined. You could still have recombinant proteins in there and then it's not technically chemically defined anymore. So um, that, that makes things a lot, lot easier if you can have those plant extracts, for example, in there. Uh, but still, it is an adaptation. You, you should slowly re 
we reduce the concentration of serum uh, and increase the concentration of your um, serum free medium. And usually this works pretty well until to, to a certain point where the cells stop growing and then you have to wait and then they finally restart growing. And this can take a couple of weeks actually. It is an adaptation process which will not work for all cell lines. A lot of cell lines lose their adherence. So working with kind of specially treated cell culture plates is helpful for that. Mm -hmm. So to, to enhance that, adding um, adherence factors like vitronectin to, the, um, to your medium can be helpful for that. But it's, it's a slow adaptation process you need to go through. That's really helpful, I think. So last question, and actually I'll just call people to the, the chat because there's some links that have been put up there on to, to the various documents. And maybe what we'll do is put those links next to the webinar on our website so that when you come to, to maybe access the slides or rewatch the webinar, you'll have those links as well. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so last question is uh, normally, in tests, the cells must be attached to the surface adhesion, mm -hmm. which, which is more advisable to transfer already cultured cells to the well plate or to thaw the cells and allow them to proliferate in the wells directly. So I guess this question is addressing assay ready cells if you use them directly to, to so we, we, we tried both. You can use the assay ready cells and wait overnight to let them adhere before you start the assay. But we also have done some experiments to, to run the assay directly with the cells which have just been treated. And this actually does not change the, the EC50. So you can use them in suspension as well. All right, we have two very last questions, and I'm going to cut it off because this are you've been yeah, so kind to answer over all time. these questions. <laughs> but um, just quickly, so uh, wondering if there are other ways of health cell health monitoring besides uh, cell viability or membrane integrity. I, this is, of course, a, a very crude measurement, but it, it, that's good for routine control of, of the continuous culture. Of course, there are other methods which are a little bit more sophisticated to, to, uh, to assess uh, um, uh, the, the status. If you think about apoptosis, for example, or uh, other markers of cell viability and health. And then, um talking about heat inactivated serum, if you're looking at inflammatory markers, does it matter which type of serum you're using? I would recommend to use heat inactivated serum here. For this right. purpose. Okay. Well, thank you all. You've gotten a lot, you've gotten a lot of thanks in the chat. So I think uh, <laughs> everyone has really appreciated your talk today. Uh, I know thank I you. do. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks all of you for joining us. Uh, today and uh, watch out on the website for we'll post some of these materials so you can send this webinar to your friends or take another look. Okay, thanks again. I hope you all have a nice evening uh, or rest of your day and a nice holiday season coming up. Thanks, Oliver. Thank you take from care. my end as well. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>